Growing up in New Orleans, my grandmother used to love listening to the gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. In particular, Mahalia's rendition of a song, How I Got Over. She'd start singing, How I got over, how did I make it over? You know, my soul looked back and wonder how I got over. And I'd look at my grandma and start laughing and say, Grandma, you're crazy. And she'd look at me and say, Baby, one day you're going to get it. <laughs> I still start laughing. And she said, Lord, we've been falling and rising all these years. But you know, my soul looked back and wonder how I got over. Now, I should have known getting over sometimes means being a little bit uncomfortable. As you can see, when I was a little girl at my birthday party, that hat was pretty tight and uncomfortable. And it still should have been some indication to me that getting over means sometimes you're going to fail. However, I said it all of the time. Failure is not an option. K through 12, I attended private Catholic schools. I graduated from college with a degree in aerospace engineering. I've worked at three Fortune 500 companies. I even have a master's degree from New Mexico State University in industrial engineering. I am an excellent problem solver. That is, when everything is in a step-by-step -step approach. Now, when things are ambiguous, I don't know about you, I don't really like that. And why do I like this step-by-step -step approach? Well, it all starts in science class. Who remembers the scientific method? <laughs> you know, step one, you ask the question. Step two, you state your hypothesis, your educated guess. Step three, you conduct your experiments. Step four, you analyze your results. And step five, you have your conclusion. If only life worked like that, right? Well, in case you don't realize it, it doesn't quite work like that. And you have to graduate from your fixed way of doing things and to what Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset and see challenges as exciting. All right, challenges are exciting maybe one, two, but after the third time, I don't think so. I just want this to be over. I'm still growing, but I want it to be over. And then you say, OK, I'm going to embrace this growth mindset. Challenges are exciting. You know, failure is only feedback. And then yourself, you say to yourself, well, maybe there's a limit to my capabilities. And you're going back and forth. Oh, the growth mindset, the fixed mindset. Oh, what am I going to do? I just want a mathematical equation. Give me some formula to solve, and I'll be OK. <laughs> but then you settle it. I'm going to totally embrace the growth mindset. But then you realize failure is still real. And then socially and emotionally, it's quite challenging. So I invite you to let go of your reason. Your reason that things should be a certain way. So for anybody that's an engineer in this audience, let it go. Let go of your reasons. <laughs> and I want you to use your imagination. Imagine you're a superstar employee. You're crushing all of your goals. You're getting performance, raises, and promotions. But then you walk into your annual performance review. Your manager sits down. And then you sit down, and he or she slides you a sheet of paper. You pick it up, and you're in a state of shock. It reads, during this performance review year, you're receiving a needs improvement. You're in a state of shock. I'm a superstar. What happened? Am I an imposter? 
Am I not technical enough? Is this because of my age? Are they just trying to weed me out? And then I asked myself a set of questions. Engineering is male dominated. How much is this about race or gender? As an African American woman, I asked myself the question if I express my disappointment too boldly, will I be labeled angry? Socially and emotionally, failure is challenging. And if we go through this social and emotional will that's given to us by Castle, there's all kind of emotions you go through. You become self-aware. What are the facts versus my emotional response? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How do I manage relationships when I feel like a complete failure? Can I recover? And for me, I'm super hard on myself. Am I alone? Is it just me? Did I miss the mark? And then I discover this story of three extraordinary African-American women through the movie Hidden Figures. It's the story of Katherine Johnson, an amazing mathematician who did all these calculations by hand. And there's Dorothy Vaughn, who not only say, I am a leader, but I'm going to lift other women as I climb and advocate for them. And there's Mary Jackson, the first African-American woman at the time at NASA who is an aerospace engineer. This happened over 30 years ago. These challenges, these unconscious biases they were facing. So I'm thinking to myself, is this a thing of the past? Well, not quite. There was a recent report called Ignored Potential, and it's a collaborative roadmap to increase the number of African-American women in engineering. It's written by the Society of Women Engineers, the National Society of Black Engineers, the Purdue University School of Engineering and Education, and the Women in Engineering Proactive Network. The report highlights that in 2006, the number of African Americans with bachelor's degrees were 5%. And 2015, the number was down to 4%. And if you think about African American women, the number is even lower. So what's going on? There's something beyond academics. And it feels like a hole in the middle, with many systemic factors that go into it. The first factor is role models. You can't be what you can't see. If I think about my own engineering career and background, in undergrad, I had no female engineering professors. In graduate school, I only had one. And if you think about it, when you're feeling isolated and you want to look up to someone, what better way than to see someone who looks like you and can understand your experiences? There's also this stereotype threat. When I walk into a situation, am I dealing with an unconscious bias that I'm not even aware of? Someone is measuring me against a stereotype that they think that I should fit into. There's biculturalism. Do I assimilate and lose myself to fit into the dominant culture? There's pay inequalities. When I graduated from college, I didn't negotiate my salary. I was just happy to get a job. And then I discovered while working in the field for about three years, and I received about an 8% raise, and my male coworker said, do you think you deserve that raise? Well, it turns out the 8% only put me at the average of the bell curve. I had no idea. And there's these feelings of isolation and belonging. Is there some 
standard of engineer that I'm supposed to be? Am I supposed to be super smart? Is there some grading skill, some expectation that I don't even know? Now, there's not all hope is lost. The report highlights ways to move around this, have professional organizations, like the ones mentioned in this collaborative report, have resources. And then I discover one of the big factors discussed in this report is social capital. Now, I must admit, I'm an introvert. So connecting with lots of people really scared me at first. OK, so I was like, where is the notebook or a report on how to meet and interact with people? Can somebody tell me what that report is? Do you mean, how many people do I have to meet? Let's see, maybe three. And I'm just overanalyzing, <laughs> overanalyzing. Now, after I was laid off in the field of engineering, I decided that I wanted to address some of these systemic factors. I wanted to become an advocate. Now, I was pretty ambitious, everybody, because I'm an introvert, and I had worked at these big companies. So now I'm out on my own, and I have to advocate for myself and speak up and say what my value is. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? So the first job that I had after engineering corporate, I worked at a small nonprofit. And if you ever worked at nonprofit, it's more like entrepreneurship. You have to do lots of jobs. And I'm still looking for the manual, the process document to tell me what I'm exactly supposed to do. And again, I fail. And in 90 days, I'm fired. Now I'm thinking, OK. I can't get past these failures. What's going on? The first thing I do is to call someone that I met. And I didn't even call her for a job. I just called because I needed someone to talk to. And she was the CEO of Hard House. And she said, well, come to Hard House on a Monday. And on a Friday, I was fired. So on Monday, I go to Hard House. And now I have a new job. This is social capital at its finest. Now, I walk into Heart House, which is an after-school program that provides safety, education, and opportunity to refugee and underprivileged children. And I'm thinking that I am, you know, I'm saving a day, I'm impacting lives. But the students of Heart House, they, they speak over 15 different languages. This is a global community. And they teach me many things about myself. I become aware of my own unconscious biases. I can't believe I have any what? Well, it turns out a student comes to me. The students are over 60% of the students are Asian students. And the student comes up to me and says, Miss Alicia, can you help me with my math homework? Now, this is an Asian student, and I'm looking like, why do you need my help? You're supposed to automatically be smart in math and sciences. I didn't say it out loud. Forgive me. This is in my head. I didn't say it out loud. I didn't, I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> and I said, OK. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Help me. What is wrong with you? I'm telling you I need help. And then I eventually helped them. And I also discovered, because I went to private schools, again, I clearly think I have no privileged tendencies. Well, turns out these, a lot of these students are in Dallas Independent School District, and they all don't have equal access to resources. So you see, I'm in private school of my career, and I'm thinking, well, access to resources, why don't you have a book? You know, why don't you have a computer? And I had to understand the environments they were coming from. So you see, when you experience unconscious biases about yourself, you don't be always aware of the other people have the same kind of biases. Now, you're going to love this one. Now, we talked about failure and social and emotionally how it impacts us. So I go in, and I'm having a bad day. And I clearly, I had taken a few acting classes, so I thought I could pretend to some seven and eight-year-olds that I'm, I got it together. So I walk in, and the student's like, hi, Miss Alicia, how are you doing? And I said, I'm fine. And the come, student comes back, um, what's wrong with you? And I said, nothing, I'm fine. The student comes back, listen, I don't really know what's wrong with you, but don't come back here tomorrow until you get it together. <laughs> Now, I am the teacher. You are the student. This is not fair. This is not how this is set up. I'm clearly not getting an Academy Award for my performance, so I got it together. Now, the next form of social capital I was able to build is a former coworker that I had worked with said, hey, Alicia, I'm on, an, on a board of a high school academy of engineering and biomedical sciences. I think you should come and join in. 
So I walk in, and they said they were looking for a board chair. Now, everything in me said, volunteer. This is growth mindset. And I was like, no, you don't know what you're going to be doing. You need to see a document of the requirements. And I get out of my head, and I say, I'm going to volunteer. Now, afterwards, I'm thinking, what did I just do? I've been on a board before, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And I realized you have to have this thing called executive presence. So earlier, you talked about the report, Ignore Potential. So I was able to have an executive male mentor through the National uh, Society of Black Engineers, the executive director agreed to be my mentor. Now, he said yes, but I'm still in my head, OK, I need to send this long letter and say why he should be my mentor. But he had already said yes, and I'm still trying to analyze, like, when am I going to get out of my head, right? And as you discover these things about executive presence, we all need executive presence because we're the CEO of our careers. And when you discover your executive presence, it's the way you act and respond to failure. It's how you communicate and then how you appear. When you look good, you feel good, and you interact good. And after a while of you building more and more social capital, you eventually meet some great people and you occasionally get a nice note and says, Miss Alicia, you're nice. You know, and so I move past the, I'm trying to be perfect and pretend to be something I'm not, when they can clearly see through it. And then it becomes an amazing experience. Now, what would make you continue to move forward after failure? The comfort can be found in the words of poet John Greenleaf Whittier, who once said, for all the sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest or these, it might have been. Let there be no more hidden figures, no more ignored potential, no more wondering if life after a bad performance review means its career ending. My grandmother is no longer with us, but if she would hear, I would give her a great big hug because I know that getting over sometimes means I had to cry my way through the midnight hour, but no tear is all that bad. Instead, you won't have to wonder what might have been because you continued to rise even after failing. <laughs>